Our fourth speaker is Jim Giswaldi, and he's the author of Excellence Beyond Compliance, which I think we just heard about, Enhancing Animal Welfare Through the Constructive Use of the Animal Welfare Act, a practical guide to bring people together to enhance the lives and welfare of animals. Giswaldi has served as a founding member and chair of the New York State Bar Association Committee on Animals and the Law. Good morning. Okay, that warrants a better presentation. Uh, thanks, first of all, to Stephanie and Ron for allowing me the opportunity to be here, and thank you to Don for the kind words. Respect for all life is the foundation. As Emmett Fox said, life is consciousness, and all of us in this room are at different states of consciousness in our journey, in our journey in dealing with animals and in our journey in terms of our own personal lives. And I think it's important that we bear that in mind. And respect for all life is the foundation. And by that, I mean to extend that to human life as well as non-human life. So that in our discourse on preaching greater compassion, dignity, and respect for animals, if we practice that towards each other, we're more likely to be successful. Advancing zoo animal welfare policy. Pretty basic stuff for the experts here in, in this room. First and foremost, in, in my opinion, after 25 years of practicing animal law and being fortunate to be involved with the zoological community, it is the key to the sustainability of the zoological community as it exists today. If animal welfare isn't priority number one, or I think as uh, Keith Winston put it yesterday, responsibility number one, uh, there is no future, because you won't maintain the goodwill of the public. In part, as uh, Mr. Rowan pointed out this morning, because of how our society and culture has evolved, because of, even more so, the animals that share our homes and that we consider to be members of our families. Um, in addition, without good to great, if not outstanding, animal welfare, how do we have the moral authority to act in congruence with our loftier missions in terms of conservation, conservation and humane education, and research and furtherance both of conservation and animal welfare. And quite frankly, um, it's just the right thing to do. That's always a great closing argument for a lawyer. It's just the right thing to do. Here, the Animal Welfare Act in the United States, I, I'm using this because it's what I'm most familiar with. I understand that the U.S. Animal Welfare Act is not necessarily the best, but it is a good representation of a limited, but still a federal uh, national animal welfare policy. Limited to certain activities such as research, commercial breeding, exhibition, um, and, and to certain species, primarily mammals. The Important overlay of accreditation, which Don spoke about this morning, uh, Deb Luke spoke about masterfully yesterday in terms of uh, what that can offer. And then my experiences. As, as a lawyer, most of the time I get involved is at the back end. And by the back end, I mean after problems have happened. Uh, and I'm not a litigator, I'm not really a defense lawyer, but people call me for help. And over the years, I've tried to uh, develop a unifying philosophy, policy, practice, to sort of build consensus, which is so elusive, particularly in uh, overheated and passionate animal issues, uh, to bring people together, not just within a zoological organization or the zoological community, but other stakeholders, other animal-related organizations, uh, agencies, critics, the public. The, the AWA, and, and thanks again to Don, I can go through some of this very quickly, is a minimum standards law. There are uh, minimum standards, some of which are engineering, which could be a four by four by four foot enclosure is, is adequate for the compliance with the act. Or they could be performance standards that you shouldn't handle an animal in such a way as to cause a certain condition. The performance standards, though, minimum, are more elastic and do provide for creativity, flexibility, and innovation, which can be a good thing for animal welfare. Maintaining compliance with the little blue book of regulations is a daily responsibility. It's important. It takes an awful lot of effort. 
uh, whether you maintain compliance or not has consequences because for three years, your inspection reports remain online and visible to the public. And that paints a certain picture of your institution. Unfortunately, the best picture that it can paint of your institution is that no non-compliant items. That's the best you can do. Uh, anything else may suggest you have a compliance or animal welfare issues. So that's another limitation that there's really, uh, yes, uh, you should start your day wanting to have no non-compliant items, but it's kind of hard to drive and inspire people just with that. The agency has been evolving and, and trying to accentuate animal welfare beyond compliance in a sense, in part through the Center for Animal Welfare, in part through their mix of tools that they use, their inspections, education, enforcement, and more guidance and best practices, particularly coming uh, with some of the activities of the Center for Animal Welfare. Um, there has also been an emphasis under Acting Administrator Kevin Shea the last few years for non-regulatory solutions. Uh, ones that uh, don't require a formal approval process so the change can happen within a reasonable amount of time. Changing landscape uh, under the Animal Welfare Act. Going back about six, seven years ago uh, with the IDA petition on elephants, and then last year there were petitions on bears and public contact with uh, bears, big cats, and non-human primates. It's sort of been an age of petitions as well as uh, an increased uh, proliferation of complaints in part driven by uh, some of the organizations that may be here in this room, in part driven by the accessibility of online and hard copy complaint forms from the agency. Again, uh, rising public uh, consciousness about animal welfare. Uh, in addition, one of the things that's happened uh, recently, particularly with commercial dog breeding, is the leveraging of state animal welfare or anti-cruelty laws to reference uh, Animal Welfare Act compliance to prohibit or regulate activities within a given state. Accreditation, as, as Don and, and Deb spoke about, provides an important overlay over the minimum standards. It's another form of self-regulation. One of the challenges with that is that especially when something bad happens, accreditation is, is great, particularly in year one and year five or six. Because when you're preparing for that accreditation evaluation, uh, going through all the preparation, going through the inspection, a lot of activity happens to drive improvement. Not to say that enlightened and credited institutions don't do that in the five years in between, uh, but it just doesn't happen at the same rate. In addition, although, and, and AZA in particular, does have requirements for processes for vetting complaints, for dealing with or investigating serious incidents, but I think respectfully those could be more robust in furthering both micro level and, and more global level improvements. And in thinking about how to go from this to a different model, really the key, and this is a a long quote from my favorite author, Steve Chandler, and I'll give you a moment to, to, to read it. Basically, the key here that I believe is that the path to making things better is as much, if not more, moving towards something, moving towards something good, the framework that Ron and Scott and, and Stephanie uh, presented yesterday. Um, as well as moving away from things that we want to see an end to, like cruelty and, and, and such. And inspiration is the key. In addition to inspiration, it's a matter of reframing so that we can bring people together. And, and this is a simple question that I, that I ask and try and use to drive some of the conversations that I've even had here this weekend. And that is, what can we, meaning all of us, do today, meaning now, to improve the well-being of animals? And I think it's an important question we should ask ourselves and our organizations every day. Because even though there are some very worthy discussions, if not debates, to have on the great ethical and philosophical concerns, sometimes we set up a false dichotomy of, of one end of the spectrum or the other, and in the meantime, we miss the opportunities that are right before us. 
the, the excellence beyond compliance model basically is one that drives continuous improvement on a daily basis in the name of animal welfare as the number one and overriding priority. It's meant to be constructive, positive, empowering, uh, and, and that is true for all, uh, all stakeholders from the zoo outside. The, the foundation of at least my three C's, compassion, commitment, and collaboration, um, everyone can make a difference. Uh, again, it's the philosophy of continuous improvement based on the Japanese uh, practice of Kaizen, small continuous improvement, because that's not necessarily as, as daunting or as overwhelming to have done. Transforming challenges into opportunities, as Napoleon Hill wrote in Think and Grow Rich, within every adversity is a seed of an equivalent or greater benefit, and if we realize that and search for that, we can find it and take every situation and make it better. Um, it, making animal welfare the priority happens when you have an Animal Welfare Act compliance officer. Many of you already have someone de facto in that position. Many of the enlightened organizations represented here have an animal welfare officer who should be an executive level uh, uh, staff person who reports to the CEO and besides knowledge of animal welfare should be two very important things, respected and approachable. Because if you're respected, your animal welfare officer as well as your animal welfare leadership group and your concern vetting process will take care of itself because you'll have such a constructive culture, things will get addressed and resolved as a matter of course. The animal welfare leadership group should include lots of areas that are not traditionally considered part of the animal welfare program. Your construction, maintenance, buildings and grounds, your safety officer. Uh, think of it, has anything other than safety garnered public attention in the zoological or animal world uh, in the last 10 years? Has, I mean, safety, safety incidents have really, you think back, those are some of the, the, the biggest uh, flashpoints for, for conversation, if not change. Again, include all resident animal species. If you're advocating conservation for amphibians but not providing them with uh, good welfare in your organization, uh, I'd say that's not uh, acting harmoniously with your mission. Uh, again, there are a set of tools, which I won't go into in great depth here, but you can use every aspect of the Animal Welfare Act process, no matter how maligned it is, you can use it to drive continuous improvement, to build team spirit and teamwork, all in the name of advancing animal welfare. Why not look forward to an inspection as a way to validate the good work you've done and to tap the expertise and experience of your inspector? And there are lots of ways you can do that. Um, when there are problems, when there are challenges, uh, I like to develop what I call zoo improvement plans, aquarium improvement plans, park improvement plans, or individual animal welfare enhancement plans to lay down a roadmap for how we can get better. To me, uh, and, and I guess this came from talking to David Frazier last night, the concept of sort of progress without judgment frees people up from that fear that sometimes paralyzes the good they can do. Even if it's not as much as some of us might like, it's still good in the right direction. Self-certified compliance reporting. You can report and should report your corrections and improvements immediately so that your inspection that may be online for a year is not the final word on what you've done and doesn't show that you acted within 24 hours and fixed everything or developed beautiful improvement plans to help your animals. Again, you can take the worst situations and, and like the line from uh, Hey Jude, make it better and excellence beyond compliance is a vehicle for that. I thank you very much. We have a couple of minutes for questions for Jim. Andrew. Yeah, I've been involved in the Animal Welfare Act since 78 and, um, and the enforced or uh, self-regulation that it requires. And one of the things that uh, I, I've always uh, felt is that the institutions, the universities and the research institutions missed a huge opportunity in 1985 uh, to 1989 when they um, resorted to identifying safe community members um, uh, as members of the Animal Care and Use Committee as opposed to going out and inviting the critics into the institutions. I know, because I was at a university from, 85, from 83 to 97, 
that there were huge changes uh, that came as a result of the 1985 amendments. But none of those changes are visible to the critics outside because almost none of them were invited into the system. And the critics who were invited in, by and large, produced no major upheavals. There were a few kerfuffles, but mostly this was a valuable thing to do. And the zoo community, I watched the, zoo, the, the same sort of thing, that the critics are not invited into the system. And as a result, I think that the accreditation process is substantially flawed uh, and weakened by the fact that critical voices are not included. One final point, D.A. Henderson, who eliminated wild, ra uh, wild smallpox in the world, uh, is now, I just learned yesterday, the other day, uh, excluded from discussions about polio vaccine er eradication because he's a critic. You know, I mean, it's just remarkable how much we sort of pull the wagons around us and keep these critical voices at bay because we're afraid of what they might have to say. Uh, wow. There is an important role for critics. And, and again, I'm a, I'm a neophyte with the Animal Welfare Act. I've only been at it since 1989. And, and in that time period, uh, I, some of the zoological organizations that I represent may have research registrations. Uh, but that portion of the AWA is one where I probably don't have the expertise that, that you do. But my view of critics is that there's a constructive role, but it's a two-way street. Somebody asked me years ago, you know, how do you know when you could talk to Andrew Rowan or someone? And the only thing I could think of was a, a line from Krista Berg's song, Don't Pay the Ferryman. You know, don't pay the ferryman until he gets you to the other side. In other words, make sure that it's mutual. And in terms of critics, um, and I say this in the book, on one hand, critics are our greatest teachers. Uh, and I for forget the, the Roman or the, the Greek, the quote used enemies, which is a term I don't use, but basically it was observe well your critics, they're the first to find your faults. Um, likewise, critics of zoological organizations or the zoological community could be a lot more constructive. And in being constructive could help reinforce maybe more modest change than, than you're willing to accept. But in doing so, you help to dissipate what I consider the great fear of the unknown. What's going to happen if I sit down and have that conversation? And, and to me, I, I think in the absence of conversation, you can't have change. And in the absence of conversation, I'm only learning from myself. So I think there is a constructive and powerful role for critics um, I think one of the things that was very helpful, though it may not have gone far enough, was the Marine Mammal Negotiated Rulemaking in the mid-1990s. That brought together all the stakeholders, revised 60% of the regulations, not some of the most contentious ones, but unfortunately those other ones haven't advanced a bit in 20 years. But people came together there and there was positive change that helped animals. Again, what can we do today to improve the well-being of animals. And I, and I welcome further conversation with you, Mr. Rome, because I know I have a lot to learn from you.